Today we are very pleased to host a policy forum in collaboration with the Peacebuilding Support Office on domestic revenue mobilization in countries emerging from conflict. We're also very privileged to have on our panel today Kieran Holmes, the General Commissioner of the Burundi Revenue Authority, and Dr. John Ohirawan, known in the UN community as Dr. John O. I'm going to call him that. I don't want to trip over his name too often, but I got it out once. Um, John O is an economist and a development practitioner, having worked for 20 years for the United Nations Development Program. I also want to introduce at the start of this session, uh, this uh, month of July here at IPI, we have a group of six visiting African fellows. This has been a tradition pretty much for the last four or five years at IPI in partnership with King's College London and the African Leadership Center to bring uh, six uh, uh, African uh, graduate students, uh, uh, young professionals in some case in the, in the group, uh, to New York for an, a month-long immersion in uh, the issues of peace, security, and development here at the United Nations. And so we're very pleased to have this group in our audience participating today and welcome again to, to all of them and all of you here with us. Uh, so today our focus is on government revenues, taxes. Not a usual topic for IPI. Yet revenues and services, managing revenues and building capacity for service delivery, delivery is the fifth goal of the five peace building and state building goals outlined in the New Deal for engagement in fragile states, as many of you know. While it comes last, on the New Deal's essential shortlist of goals for countries coming out of conflict and for their international partners, it certainly deserves the attention usually given to the other four goals, which I'll mention, legitimate politics, security, justice, and the economic foundations of jobs and improved livelihoods. Now, as you all know, peace building is at core an exercise in transformation, a process of re-knitting the social cohesion in a society. State building involves relaunching or establishing new, open, and accountable institutions. Both are processes that can be sustainable when they build capacity and produce transparent systems. Tax authorities are essential institutions fundamental to governance. Yet I never met anybody who likes to pay taxes. So I very much look forward to the presentation and the discussion. So let me introduce briefly our panelists. You have their bios in front of you. But today we welcome Kieran Holmes, who has successfully transformed internal revenue authorities in countries emerging from conflict. Kieran has served as the general commissioner of the Burundi Revenue Authority since 2010 and has guided the tax reform exercise in Burundi since that date. Kieran has worked in the international development arena for almost 30 years. He has overseen the creation of new tax laws, better tax administration, and new double taxation agreements in countries such as Kiribati, Lesotho, and Swaziland. In addition, Kieran worked in Rwanda as, an, as the advisor to the Commissioner General of the Rwanda Revenue Authority and project manager for the United Kingdom's DFID. Welcome, Kieran. Uh, to my left, uh, we have Dr. John O. John O is an international consultant and part-time lecturer, most recently uh, as adjunct professor at Columbia University and the New School. He served at the United Nations Development Program for about 20 years, retiring as Deputy Assistant Administration of the Bureau for Crisis Prevention and Recovery. Uh, prior to joining UNDP, John was a professor of economics at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. He had also taught at the University of Guyana and was twice a visiting fellow at the Institute of Development Studies, University of Sussex. So welcome, welcome John. So uh, Kieran, we'll turn the mic over to you and welcome again to IPI. Uh, thank you, Maureen. <clears throat> uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Kieran Holmes and I've worked supporting countries to build their revenue administrations in the Pacific, Africa, and the Middle East for the last 29 years. Uh, prior to that, I worked for the Irish Revenue as a higher grade inspector of taxes, having graduated from Trinity College Dublin in, in 1977. 
When I looked at this, at this speech last night, I realized it was a bit long, so I'm, I'm, going, I've just, I'm planning to cut out bits of it, but I am going to speak for about 12 to 15 minutes, if that's okay. Um, so just to say that, as Maureen said, since June 2010, I've worked as the Commissioner General of the Office Brunde de Reset, the OBR, a position that is provided by Trademark East Africa. And Trademark East Africa is a trade facilitation and regional integration vehicle that is financed by Belgium and the UK, amongst others. In my speech today, I hope to show the importance of domestic revenue mobilization in peace building and state building, and I want to advocate for greater international involvement in building effective revenue institutions as a means of ending poverty and creating the conditions for economic growth in the countries where we operate. During the course of my career in supporting strong reform uh, agendas in seven countries, I've discovered some important lessons. I believe no country is too small nor too poor to expand its tax base, and even countries devastated by conflict can use domestic revenue collection to stimulate economic recovery. Countries have more to gain from growing their tax bases than they do from relying on international development assistance. When we compare financial flows such as international development assistance, emigrants' remittances and tax revenues, we find that emigrants' remittances are often a bigger income flow than international development assistance. Tax revenue growth, properly managed, can far exceed the sum of the two, thus making it a far more important source of development finance. A transparent, predictable, automatic and modern tax administration is highly appreciated by investors and the business community. Many business people realise that paying corruption is dead money whereas paying taxes to a country that manages its public finances in an orderly and transparent manner means that a government is empowered to invest in infrastructure, which in turn creates an improved and enhanced climate for further investment and business growth. Quite often, corruption can be as costly as the taxes evaded by the businessman, especially when there are multiple payees along the line, such as roadblocks, and other means of extracting economic rents. Often the people preyed upon in this fashion are small and micro businesses. Indeed, these are often female-owned businesses trading across borders or in micro mar markets. Corruption is therefore a tax on the poor. Building a tax system in a country implies stimulation of the overall investment climate. The tax administration interacts with other administrations that impact on the business community, such as the Investment Promotion Agency, the Land Registry, the Business Names Registry, and the other border agencies, such as the Police, Immigration Bureau of Standards, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Trade, and so on. If the tax administration demonstrates an open and transparent way of doing business, the other agencies are often compelled to follow suit. Building a tax system in a country implies stimulation of the overall investment climate in the international sphere as well as in the domestic environment. Revenue authorities in neighbouring states always want to interact with each other. They want to share information that is useful to each other and they want to share training and other experiences in best international practices. They also want to negotiate international double taxation agreements and agreements for the legal exchange of information and best practice, all of which help to create a better investment climate. And improving the business climate facilitates investment and business growth, leading to more jobs and a reduction in poverty. More tax revenues are created, leading to more funds for infrastructural development, including expenditure on healthcare and education. And this in itself is good for the business sector. Indeed, this can be part of an overall reconstruction and peace building strategy for countries emerging from war. I just want to give you some real life examples of what I'm talking about from my own experiences. But as I said earlier, I'm just going to concentrate now on Rwanda and Burundi. In Rwanda, we grew the revenue base by 700% in the years 2002 to 2010 from about 118 million US dollars per annum to around 710 million per annum. By the end of this reform, the Rwanda Revenue Authority was collecting over 90% of the government's recurrent budget requirements, thus freeing the country substantially from aid dependency <coughs> and allowing for greater domestic investment in basic infrastructure, health and education expenditure. 
In Rwanda, we computerized the tax and customs administrations. We drafted new income tax, tax procedures and VAT laws. We negotiated double taxation agreements with Mauritius and Belgium. We broadened the tax base and we significantly improved the climate for investment. Burundi, between 2010 and 2012, we almost doubled Burundi's revenue take from the base of 300 billion Burundi francs, which is 247 million uh, US dollars in 2009, um, rising up to $434 million in 2012. We transparently recruited new staff, reduced tax rates, enacted new laws, modernized the tax administration, and engaged with other agencies to create one-stop shops for new business registrations and land transfers. The result of this was to create a much improved business climate in Burundi. Last year, Burundi was the only African country to appear in the World Bank's top 10 most improved business climate locations in its Doing Business Index. His Excellency Pierre Nkurunziza, the President of the Republic, has commented that the Revenue Authority has enabled the government to meet its own wages bill, something that was not possible before the creation of the Revenue Authority. Plans are afoot for the creation of new uh, double taxation agreements with Belgium and the Netherlands, as well as a new mining code and a new investment promotion code. Agreements for the creation of new one-stop border posts have been signed with all of Burundi's uh, East African neighbours, and three new modern one-stop border posts are being rolled out, two of which are, are in fact operational. It's worth noting that both Rwanda and Burundi were devastated by civil wars. Both are very small economies and both are highly dependent on external aid. So, what are the key actions that are necessary to create the conditions for strong domestic revenue mobilization across all countries? For me, the single most important activity is the creation of a semi-independent revenue authority capable of hiring and firing its own employees. I say semi-independent because although the Revenue Authority comes under the auspices of the Ministry of Finance, it has a board of man management, a chief executive, in this case myself, and an executive or senior management team. The next most important step is the open and transparent recruitment of personnel for the Revenue Authority, allied with the creation of the internal disciplinary environment, such as the Code of Conduct, the disciplinary committees, detailed job descriptions and terms and conditions of employment. After that, the next most important function is building capacity within the Revenue Authority so that taxpayers come to see that the members of staff are professional, honest and capable of delivering the required level of service. Low pay for tax office staff is a big driver of corruption and creating the Revenue Authority often means paying staff at market rates. While the staff of the Revenue Authority probably end up far better paid than their predecessors under the previous dispensation, it is possible to achieve the payment of market rates for qualified personnel well within a ceiling of between 2.5% to 3% of the revenue collected. Building capacity means substantial investment in training, in computers and international technical assistance, and is a medium-term investment of several years for which external assistance may be required. Creating new modern tax laws drafted in plain language and containing strong penalty provisions as well as detailed source and residency rules is an essential component of the strategy. It will also be necessary to remove tax provisions from other laws such as the investment promotion laws, the mining laws and other pieces of legislation. The new revenue laws are the essential prerequisites for new tax and customs procedures, which have to be introduced based on modern, internationally recognised best practices, again implying the importance of some degree of regional, if not neighbourly, integration. All modern tax administrations require investment in information systems, not only in tax and customs administration, but in the back office functions as well. Although it sounds trite to say it, Properly designed open plan offices have a great role to play in advancing transparency and promoting work sharing, workflows and a strong sense of camaraderie in the revenue administration. At the OBR, 
I told my staff that I planned to remove all the internal walls in the offices. Quite a few of them didn't believe me, and they were quite shocked to turn up for work on Monday morning to find the walls had been removed and there was suddenly a whole new way of working. <laughs> Trade facilitation and regional integration have to be cornerstones of the strategy. Everything must be done to facilitate business growth and investment. This includes introducing self-assessment in all taxes, automatic, non-discretionary and transparent entitlement to all incentives by law and never by the discretionary decision of any bureaucrat or minister. Strong reliance on modern procedures, risk assessment and computer systems, as well as properly managed and fully integrated one-stop border posts to speed goods and people across international boundaries. Finally, a strong, sustained and effective communication strategy is essential to continually inform the population and all stakeholders of the need for the reform, as well as to keep everyone informed in real time of the various stages of the reform. This is a hugely important exercise for building democracy and for facilitating the debate on how the society should tax itself. It goes without saying that this activity needs to be conducted at all levels, state, regional and communal, not to mention on the international level, as I am doing here today and as I was doing in Oslo with the Burundi diaspora last month. So, now that we have the key activities of the reform, what are the key determinants of success? For me, there are a number of critical success factors, the absence of any one of which will threaten the success of the reform agenda. These are strong top-level political support. The head of state and the cabinet must be fully, completely and actively involved in the revenue reform agenda and be openly involved in supporting it. Nothing less will do. There must be a long-term and active involvement from and across the donor community. Donors must be prepared to take an accompaniment approach, having technical assistance, boots on the ground for many years. Transparency in the management of the public finances is essential and donor assistance must be predicated on commitments made by the recipient country that this will be done. There must be full transparency in the national budget, in public procurement and in the management of all state enterprises. If not, taxpayers will never have the confidence required to comply with the tax laws. But even with these key determinants of success in place, some risks remain, and these primarily are resistance to change. Sometimes not all members of the government or the private sector embrace the changes that are needed, and this resistance can threaten the success of the revenue reform. Security, it is essential to invest in security, and this includes the security of tax and customs officials, international personnel and offices and equipment, again, a poor security environment will threaten and can derail the reform agenda. Although it might seem that the required donor investment to make what I have outlined work is substantial, in fact, this is not the case. Many of the laws, best practices, and internationally recognized and modern procedures exist and are freely transferable. Computer systems and hardware continues to fall in price, the example I like to give is Rwanda. The UK's Department for International Development, DFID, supported the Rwanda Revenue Authority for a 12-year period beginning a few years after the genocide, and the investment by DFID during that 12-year period was £24 million. At the conclusion of the investment period, the Rwanda Revenue Authority was collecting the equivalent value of the entire 12 years of the DFID investment every couple of weeks or so. Ladies and gentlemen, there are few comparable investments with that rate of return anywhere on the planet, either in the private or public sectors. Ladies and gentlemen, my concluding remark, and I hope I'm within my self-imposed self time limit, but my, my concluding remark, and I'm sure it will not surprise any one of you, given what I've said earlier, is this. I believe that it is incumbent on the international community 
to ensure that all international development assistance is conditional on a country's willingness to mobilize its own domestic revenues. And those countries that show a real willingness to do so must go to the top of the list for receipt of donor support. If we are serious about helping fragile states to move away from that status and take their rightful place as functioning states, capable of delivering real services to their populations, then we must work to end all vestiges of a welfare mentality. States must be forcefully made aware that they cannot hope to rely on the support of taxpayers from other countries unless they are actively seeking to create the conditions whereby the taxpayers, especially the elites of their own countries, contribute their fair share. By adopting this policy, we will advance the social contract and make these states into better places for the growth of democracy and the protection of human rights. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to remind everyone about a particular event from the history of the United States. On December the 16th, 1773, American colonists, objecting to paying levies imposed by Britain on the grounds that they had no obligation to pay taxes levied by a parliament in which they had no representation and disguised as Red Indians, boarded three British ships and tossed the cargo of tea chests into Boston Harbor, having first split them open with tomahawks. This memorable event, known to every schoolboy and schoolgirl as the Boston Tea Party, has come to embody the principle of no taxation without representation. To the mantra of no taxation without representation, I believe we need to add the refrain of no development assistance without taxation. Now that should be every policymaker's cup of tea. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Karen. I think your last comment there about no development assistance without uh, taxation is very catchy. And I look forward to the discussion because, you know, you talked about the interconnectedness uh, of what you do, the relationship between the laws in the country, then the issues around uh, the inter I'd call it interagency cooperation, you know, with the land registry or whomever is issuing business licenses, as well as the regional cooperation. So I look forward to a discussion on on some of, of those issues and, and how you have worked through them. Uh, so with that, I would like to turn to our discussion, uh, discussant, Dr. John O, and so the mic is yours. Thank you. Uh, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I, uh, I may sound slightly nasal. I, it's, I just recovering from a cold. It's, don't take it personally, please. Uh, it's hard to be a discoursant when you agree mostly with the, um, with the presenter. Let me highlight three points that I think resonate very strongly with me in what uh, Mr. Holmes said. First, that countries have much more to gain from growing their tax bases than from relying on international development assistance. Having been in that business for a few years, I think there is one of the most fundamental truths, if there were any, in development business. Secondly, building a tax system in the country implies a stimulation of the overall investment climate, and I might add, the country's own economic growth prospects. Thirdly, that tax revenue properly managed can far exceed the sum of international assistance and remittances. This is already the case, or it's already the case that in many African countries, remittances far outstrip uh, international development assistance. And I think the more fundamental question is that there is plenty of scope, not just in the fragile states and the post-conflict states, but in most African countries that I'm most familiar with, there is plenty of scope for domestic resource mobilization that will make international development assistance hopefully totally unnecessary within a generation. Now, I was in Rwanda uh, for a few months last year, having been there earlier about six years ago, and I was able to see some of the lessons and what some of these lessons meant in practice. As noted by Mr. Holmes, computerized tax systems, new laws, tax procedures, new including VAT laws and things like that, 
The question is, as a result of that, Rwanda is already the most talked about African country in terms of what's done with its economy. And not only because it was a post-conflict or post-genocide uh, um, situation, but in fact, of any country in Africa, it has had some of the most dramatic changes, and a lot of it is due to what happened with the tax administration. So against this background, some of my comments, and I have three broad comments, may have some of a parallax character, but bear with me. Hopefully, it might make some sense at the end. My first issue has to do with the relationship between taxes and incentives for the private sector. Mr. Holmes suggested, and I agree, that tax provisions should be removed from other laws like mining and investment laws. The question, therefore, is what kinds of tax incentives are appropriate, and how do you put this in context in post-conflict situations? In your typical post-conflict situation, how do you empower local entrepreneurs and support local business development? This is essential as a signal of a return to normalcy. And of course, relatedly, how do you reignite foreign investment interest? Perceptions of risk delay entry of private enterprise in post-conflict situations. They may be quick to pursue exploration contracts in resource-rich research, research countries, as we've seen in Sierra Leone or in Liberia. But they may delay long-term investments in production until they are better assured of the country's stability. So question is, what kinds of tax allowances and political risk insurance can we build in the system and at what time appropriately in the immediate aftermath of a conflict? My second issue, which is somewhat related, has to do with timing again and sequencing. The Independent Rwanda Revenue Authority was established in November 1977, 1997. The question is, could it, should it have been earlier or later? While it's widely agreed that, the, that independent or at least semi-independent revenue authorities are essential, it may be useful to ask what combination of factors are most conducive to their coming into existence. Some of the characteristics from their success were listed, and I agree entirely, in, uh, in Mr. Mr. Holmes' statement. What I'm pointing about is on what are the best conditions that are for the putting in place, the establishment of these kinds of authorities, independent or semi-independent authority. Could it have happened in Rwanda five years earlier? And would it have made a difference if it came two years later? So those kinds of questions, I think, are some that we probably need to answer. My third issue has to do with the statement on the importance of domestic revenue mobilization in peace building and state building, and the need for greater international involvement in building effective institutions as a means of ending poverty and creating the conditions for economic growth. I have two questions here questions in general sense. First, I think the exceptional conditions in countries with post-conflict or fragile situations gives the inter international community exceptional leverage. And this could be a double-edged sword. How do we ensure national ownership in such conditions? How do we avoid making our priorities their priorities? The second issue I had raised is also relevant here. By 1997, it was quite clear who was speaking for Rwanda. It's not always the case, especially in the immediate aftermath of conflict. And even in countries that are not in that situation but are fragile for other reasons, there is still that question of whether there is a national ownership or a national consciousness that you are responding to. The second aspect is, I think, most people will agree that there is nothing to suggest that independent revenue authorities are useful only in post-conflict situations. In my view, most African countries could certainly benefit from better revenue authorities. Most of these countries are actually much richer than Burundi or Rwanda, and yet domestic revenue mobilization continues to be a major problem for them. So what can be done? 
Do we have any ideas on how to grow that political will? Those necessary conditions, absolutely necessary for the head of state and cabinet to be involved. What is it that we can do to convince them that transparency may ultimately be better than the low-hanging fruit, corruption? As I said at the beginning, I have very little issue to pick with what Mr. Holmes said. What I've tried to do is to broaden the issues a little bit by placing the question as one of a great institution, the Revenue Authority, in a set of possibly inefficient and corrupt institutions. Wonderful, highly computerized, with network access to the world, room in a house of many buildings where everything else is falling apart. That, for a lot of African countries, a lot of post-conflict countries, that is the major structural problem. So yes, I think you've done a great job. What I'm wondering is, your young interns here, what do we tell them when they go back to their countries, many of which are not necessarily post-conflict countries? Thank you. Well, thank you, John, and really thank you both, because I think you've set this up for a great uh, conversation and discussion. And I certainly think uh, uh, your points, uh, the, the issues of interconnectedness, timing, and then international leverage, um, uh, very uh, key in this discussion. And I want to key off your last, your last point about international leverage versus national ownership on the issues and the priorities and the decision makings that face countries coming out of conflict. Uh, and I want to key off on that for my first question, and I'm going to turn to you, Kieran, uh, uh, with this. Uh, you talked very much about how in your role, uh, particularly in Burundi, that uh, you, know, you had this mandate from the, the top leadership, the senior leadership in the, in the government, um, and that has uh, you know, enabled and facilitated your work. But as an, as, as an outsider, however, when you arrive in a country like uh, Burundi or Rwanda, how do you gain broader trust and legitima legitimacy with your, with your staff, with these, and in particular, I think of the other agencies in the different departments, as uh, John was saying, the different rooms uh, in the house? How do you build uh, those relationships? How do you develop the support and cooperation? Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Maureen. Um, yes, there is, there is no substitute for the mandate from the top leadership. You simply must have that as the starting point for in intervention. Um, and and that, I've been very lucky to have that in, in every country uh, where I worked. Um, the issue of trust, you gain trust by doing your job and by showing uh, demonstrable increases in revenue from a, right from the off. Fortunately, it's not that difficult to do that because when you, when you follow the standard best practice of having your taxpayers segregated between large, medium, and small, and you concentrate immediately on your large taxpayers, the ones who want to be compliant, you find that uh, the revenue will grow very quickly right from the off. Uh, large businesses, are not so much interested in corruption. They're more interested in stability and predictability. What they want to see is a predictable environment where they can carry on their investments um, and they can uh, pay their taxes in an open and transparent way, ideally without any intervention at all from the tax administration. So the trust comes when, when the revenue comes, and the revenue comes from uh, following best practices and, uh, and, and allowing the large taxpayers, those who want to comply, to actually comply so that you have a win-win situation. Thank you. And uh, John, I'm actually going to draw on your, your bio for the question that I had to, from you. Is I saw in your bio, as I understood it, you were the lead author on a book on, uh, or a report on ingenuity and ingenious, ingenious, uh, uh, yes. yes. And I wonder, is there anything in this, this area as, as far as uh, contributing to uh, development in the area of uh, tax and finance? Uh, that you got from that work or that fine, or any other example that you could draw on in highlighting the centrality of uh, a well-functioning uh, central tax authority and the, the interlinkages, uh, that what makes it work? 
Just two things strike me as I think particularly relevant in the context of this discussion. From that report, if I, um, if I remember correctly, one of the issues that we were highlighting was the fact that no matter how bad a war or a conflict, traditional mechanisms of various sorts are always left in play, including in most systems, ways in which communities actually mobilize savings and mobilize revenues from their authorities. Now, of course, the longer the war, the more difficult the situation becomes for them, but they're not completely destroyed. And one of the things that needs to be done is to actually reestablish the relationship between taxation and representation. Yes, this thing about no, rep no taxation without representation, the obvious is what tends to happen. People are subjected to taxation without representation. And I think going back on some of the elements of traditional activity, traditional community systems, allows them to, to have some representation and makes the paying of taxes or any kind of contribution to the social good less onerous. I think that's one particular lesson that, that came out there. The second, quite quickly, is that in many situations, along with your central authority, one needs to make sure that several sort of at subsidiary levels that the same kinds of mechanisms are introduced, much more simplified, but the same kinds of ways of doing business. Great. Well, thank you very much. So now I'm going to open up the floor to discussion. I'm going to take uh, a couple of questions by rounds. I already see three hands. And uh, there's a fourth. This is good. So we'll take about three or four questions or so, and we'll do a couple rounds. And I'd like to start here with the ambassador of uh, uh, Liberia. Liberia. And we're very honored to have you here with us. And I'm sure you're going to have a good question. Do I have to stand? Thank you very much. Uh, let me thank the uh, panelists, Mr. Holmes and uh, our colleague, ex-UDP, uh, for very excellent uh, presentations. Um, you know that this is now a very interesting topic. Uh, it is something which uh, has come out very strongly in the report of the Secretary General's high-level panel of eminent persons on the post-2015 uh, development agenda, and uh, it's a polarizing issue, uh, you you know, and so I, I think that we have to be a little bit careful, even though you can do what you want in your independent capacity, but I think we have to be a little bit careful how we pose it. Uh, it was a little bit threatening when you said uh, in your conclusion, Mr. Holmes, all international assistance should be contingent on countries willing to work uh, on this. I mean. You know, it's a good thing. We should be doing doing that. Uh, but when you p put it in that way, you feed into the fears that people have. And the fear is that they want us to do it all by ourselves. But they made commitments yesterday which they have not fulfilled. Uh, the international, the, the donor community made commitments to make a certain amount of the income uh, available for development assistance, and, and, and those commitments have not been met. So when you put it this way, you introduce domestic resource mobilization, which is good, I have to say, uh, and I would say that my country fully subscribes to it. If you put it in that way, it becomes, you feed into the fear. So that's just something that I wanted you to see, end all vestiges of welfare mentality. That's too harsh, is what my first reaction is. The second reaction is to, although I believe that it's a good thing, huh? uh, and I must say, as I said, my country subscribes to it, and right now we're in the process of creating the autonomous uh, revenue uh, authority, uh, taking revenue out of the Ministry of Finance and really making it an autonomous uh, entity, and hopefully it will do all of the things that you said, and we will benefit from some of the experience and the practice. But I think that uh, he has raised uh, uh, some very good points, and I want to come in on the issue of timing and sequencing. When is a good time? When is the, is the environment right for you to introduce these kinds of things that could lead to some destabilization in your whole governance, even if it is fully backed by your leadership. 
And in the beginning, particularly in a post-conflict situation, your leadership needs all the support it can get. And it wants to shy away from all the very controversial things that will polarize people more. And there will be people who don't have the money anyway in a post-conflict situation to start paying you taxes. So just to that question of timing and sequencing, is it a good time now for Liberia to be starting, or should we have done it? I mean, we already passed uh, so many years, almost 10 years from, from, the, from the peace agreement. So that's my issue. When is a good time to do it? Thank you very much, Ambassador. We're going to take two more questions. And I know I saw, I think, uh, Hans-Jan Brinkman in the back, and then this gentleman over here. And then we'll, we'll do another round. Uh, Hank Jan Brinkman, uh, Peace Building Support Office. Um, I was very glad, uh, Mr. Holmes, you raised the issue of the social contract. Um, as uh, Maureen mentioned, um, in the fifth peace building and state building goals of the New Deal, um, the revenues are tied to the services. Um, and I think that's very uh, critical um, um, to, to build that social contract. So you mentioned that it's um, not too difficult to raise revenues quickly, but it's often much more difficult to increase the expansion and delivery of services, uh, especially throughout the country in remote areas. Um, and I wonder whether you can comment on that to, in, in support of the building of the social contract in the society. This question over the gentleman over here. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Stephen Jackson. Um, just returned from uh, two years as Chief of Staff of the UN Office in Burundi. Uh, two years where I think we were the two only Irishmen in Burundi and we knew each other well. So Kieran won't be terribly surprised by um, my coming at him with a uh, a political question, and it, funnily enough, it builds directly on um, the, the question that Henk Jan just raised about a social contract. Um, because, Ambassador, I'm, I'm one of the, the weird people you may never have met. I, in, back in the days before I was a UN bureaucrat, I used to enjoy paying taxes, precisely uh, and sincerely, because I felt it was my side of the social contract. Um, I think, Kieran, you, you pointed to at least four overlapping constituencies that have to be on board, on side, politically, um, for this to work. Um, you need the, the buy-in of the broad population, and I think Henk Jan is right that that comes when they see that the taxes that they're paying are resulting in a betterment of, of, of basic service delivery. Um, that has its challenges, but, but it can perhaps be met. And I think in Burundi, for example, the massive increase in enrollment in primary education um, uh, did uh, played a role in, 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 in getting people to understand what was happening. The second is the private sector. You touched on that, and I think, as you rightly said, a private sector can trade in um, a certain latitude and freedom for a certain predictability. Um, the third, um, writ large, I mean, the nation as a whole, why is the nation as a whole perhaps interested in this? And you, you, you provided something of, a, of an answer there, that in terms of economic sovereignty, fiscal sovereignty, that this is a way for the country as a whole to be the country that it wants to be and to be out from under a dependency on international assistance. But it's the political elites is the other constituency that you really need. And I think uh, I'd be interested to hear more about how they can be convinced that this is really not just in the interests of the country, but in their own interest. Uh, that seems to me to be the hard one. And um, uh, let's just say that that's been the topic of conversations that you and I have had in Burundi um, uh, to, to try and find ways of saying to the political class, this is in your long-term interest too, even if in the short run, it may not look like it. So perhaps I can wind up a long um, intervention by just asking you to comment a little more on how, uh, what, what's the, the right combination of um, uh, persuasion and pressure on the political class in a post-conflict environment to be able to try and carry this forward. Thanks. Okay, so thank you. So go ahead, Kieran, and then John, we'll give you a chance to comment as well. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, Ambassador, yeah, I, I, I agree that my, my comments um, were possibly deliberately provocative, a little bit, maybe a little bit too harsh. But, um, you know, I'm somebody, we, in Rwanda, we, uh, Rwanda Revenue Authority invented taxpayers' day. 
and Taxpayers' Day is a unique event whereby people celebrate tax compliance. You don't find that in many, many Western countries. Uh, the head of state, uh, President Kagame, um, addressed every one of Taxpayers' Day that I was present at. And his speech invariably said, how can we ask the taxpayers of donor countries to support us if we don't take revenue from our own taxpayers? And uh, that, that, that speech uh, resonated with me every year, and, and, I, and I fully agree with it. Um, the International Development Committee of the British Parliament, the House of Commons, wrote a report about Pakistan recently. And the reason that I, I mention it is because I wrote, an, I wrote an article for the Guardian newspaper about Pakistan uh, as a result of that, art, of that report. Um, and what's interesting about this is Pakistan is the biggest single recipient of UK aid. And uh, it, it receives about 250 million pounds, but it's rising to about 450 million pounds in the next couple of years. But the, the contribution, the, the, the revenue flow from the British diaspora, the Pakistani diaspora resident in the UK, is twice the value of that. And if you look at the, uh, the share of taxes collected by Pakistan, it's 10% of GDP. It's one of the lowest in the world. Now, even uh, I think it was a three-quarter percent increase, uh, three-quarters of GDP increase in Pakistan would more than dou double the, 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 would more than equal the value of both the remittances and the aid that is flowing uh, towards Pakistan. Uh, clearly, uh, Pakistan and other countries like it clearly have the, uh, the, the possibility of taxing their own elites to the point where they could actually forego the other two revenue flows and be better off. Now, Pakistan is also a nuclear state. So they, there is evidence of political will in building the nuclear capacity, but there's no evidence of political will in taxing their own elite. And that's my point. <laughs> um, the, the second question was about expanding services and how, how I'm sorry? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and how quickly um, uh, can services be expanded regarding the social contract? And I would say immediately, in Burundi, uh, even though uh, Burundi is still a hugely aid-dependent economy, uh, public funds have been used to build dams, to build hospitals. Uh, in Rwanda, um, we, we reached the point where the Rwanda Revenue Authority was contributing 90% of the state's recurrent budget. Uh, so all the, the education and health services were 90% funded by domestic resources. And uh, they were rolled out very, very quickly to, uh, to, to the regions, to up country, and so on. So maybe there is an advantage in, in having a small state, um, but, uh, but that was certainly the case. Uh, regarding Stephen's question about the overlapping constituencies and how do we, uh, I think I've already dealt with a little bit about the elite, but uh, you're right. Um, I, I suppose I could throw the question back by referring to a, a statement by uh, Sean Lamass, a former Irish Taoiseach, who said that a rising tide lifts all boats. And so the actual, the elite have as much to gain from transparency, from open societies, and from uh, the, the economic development that comes with that by, by paying their taxes. And I think that's, that's the message that the, uh, that the head of state and the reformers need to get across to the elite, that they actually have a lot to gain. And we're, looking, we're seeing that now in Burma when, with, with, the, with the, uh, the, the developments in Burma in recent years. Thanks. So, so, John, did you want to say anything on any of the issues raised? Questions? Just one quick um, response to the ambassador's question about when is the right time. It's, I think what can be said fairly certainly is that the day after the war ends is not the right time. When the, when the, when the, the conversation is dominated by humanitarian considerations and things like that, it's certainly not the wrong time. Well, maybe two days later, after that's going, is a time to begin to ask those questions. And one of the reasons I say that is that the conditions of making um, of success in Mr. Holmes' list includes actually paying those people a little better than the average. 
If the average is so miserable for everybody, you really cannot do that. And I think that's one of the reasons why you will have to wait for a few years until things stabilize and people have an idea of normalcy. And even then, it will be maybe 10% better than miserable, but at least that difference will be there. So I would say, in the case of Liberia, obviously it's ready now, no doubt about that. But it wouldn't have been ready five years ago, quite frankly. Yeah. So I know um, we had a question here in the back, and then we have two from our fellows. So where did our, you can go. Thanks. Um, my name is Kira O'Coin. I'm with the Conflict Prevention and Peace Forum at the Social Science Research Council. My question is to Mr. Holmes again, and while we're on the topic, I'm also an alumni of Trinity College Dublin. <laughs> um, uh, my question is on, I found it interesting that you didn't mention decentralization as a necessary action or as a key strategy for success or a, a point, I mean, a policy to lead to success, because in the case of Rwanda, I know that that is one of their the major um, you know, developments in the government and something they're very proud of is the extent of the, how the decentralization in the country. How much do you think decentralization facilitates a better, um, you know, collection of taxes and uh, for the overall system? Is it a necessary component or is it just something that makes it more efficient? Because um, this is something that's broadly recommended to all post-conflict states is a, you know, some degree of decentralization. My second question is on your point about no taxation about represent, without representation. Obviously, in the case of Rwanda, that you know, that's a, opens up a lot of questions about taxation and representation in the state with the rest of the population. And with your experience across Burundi and Rwanda, which has very different approaches to national unity, how much do you think um, revenue collection can be a tool for building national unity? As we know that um, one of the goals of peace building is to help societies fractured after war to build back um, national consensus and, and to live peacefully among each other. So yeah, that's my question, thanks. Okay, so we have uh, two questions up here. We'll start with Clement and then Dalaya. And yes, just introduce uh, yourself briefly. Uh, my name is Clement, um, an ALC fellow and an IPI fellow um, from Ghana. Um, my question goes to Doc. I mean, in relatively stable African societies, the problem about the taxation system is not about how many tax regimes exist, neither is it about the willingness of the people to pay taxes. I think it's about the efficiency in collecting from as many people as possible. You find that in Ghana, for instance, most of the people who actually pay tax are government workers who are on government payrolls. Those in the informal sector, like the market women, um, those who are doing their own kinds of businesses, don't really get to pay the tax because the systems are not there to collect from them. Do you have some thoughts on how to improve the widening of the tax systems in, in those stable African societies? Um, I'm Dalaya, also LC, an IPI fellow from Ethiopia. Um, my first question is about um, domestic ta tax mobilization, and particularly asking the question, who is paying tax? Um, you talk about this bureaucracy who's like very separate from the politics and you know who col who collects taxes and does not you know is very independent from the politics. But um, I'd, I'm sure you're aware of political parties owning businesses, political or political party members owning businesses. I think both in Rwanda and Ethiopia and other number of countries. And I would like to hear your comment on how that affects um, tax collection within those countries, because there has been a debate of um, tax evasion, um, not really being, you know, like fully bureaucratic and neutral um, to collect uh, taxes. The second one is. There has recently there has been a discussion about multinational companies and tax evasion in Africa, and how multinational companies are not paying taxes and they're taking advantage of the weak um, tax systems within Africa. And 
I know you are very strong about making conditionalities on these governments, but what do you say to these circumstances where you have American and UK um, companies who come um, use resources and evade taxes? And which I think is very important because I mean a lot of resources have are being taken out from Africa and the people and the government themselves um, are not really uh, benefiting. So I would like to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. So Kieran, go ahead and you start and then John. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the question about decentralization, uh, and of course I presume you mean also deconcentration, is actually a very good one. It's, a, it's a hugely important. Um, in Burundi and, and also in Rwanda, uh, we have been uh, setting up offices in, in all the regions. Uh, and I'm trying also to, to create the conditions to make it much easier for people up country to comply with their taxes. For example, we've set up, we're setting up now a situation whereby small taxpayers can make tax payments using mobile phone technology, which means that people are, don't have to just come in from the, from the countryside and maybe incurring as much cost as the, as the tax itself uh, just to pay their taxes. The same with motor vehicle registration. We'd, we want to allow people to register their motor vehicle using a mobile phone to, to register a vehicle. And being able to register vehicles not just for one year but for three years or five years even. Um, it's very important to have tax offices decentralized into the main population centers uh, outside the capital city. Um, and, and what I've been trying to do with the, with the office Brunde de Reset is to, is to have a single point of contact in the main cities, uh, usually embedded in the, in the local administration, in the local authority, whereby people can come in and see about paying their taxes. Um, so as I say, it's, it's, it's hugely important. It doesn't raise uh, fantastic amounts of money, but it is, it is important from the point of view of equity from the point of view of people uh, outside the capital city participating in the tax system, um, and it's important from the point of view of democracy. Um, the second question, how much can revenue collection be a tool for creating national consensus? Uh, it's, it's hugely important, again. Um, in Burundi, uh, since I've been there and since we've been publicizing what we're doing, we're having the national debate going as to who should pay tax and who should be exempt. Exemptions, uh, we, we, touched, we touched on exemptions earlier. Exemptions, out of a tax collection of 600 billion, uh, exemptions are over 120 billion. So you can imagine if those exemptions didn't exist, and many of them are discretionary, if those exemptions didn't exist, uh, tax rates could be slashed or uh, different taxes could be abolished to pay for, uh, so paying for those exemptions is now part of the national debate in Burundi. And people are asking the question, well, why should so-and-so get an exemption? For what reason? And these, these, these debates are out in the open. They're being conducted in the newspapers. They're being conducted by people in, in bars and so on. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we're having to look at now is having to increase fuel tax. And again, the equity of broad-based uh, excise taxes is now on the table uh, in Burundi. So I think these, these debates um, do, are healthy, and they do promote democracy, and they do uh, um, raise the issue as to who should be taxed. Uh, is it fair? Uh, is the tax falling uh, correctly on, on the right people with the right, either with the right income or with the right expenditure? And I think all of those are healthy for, for democracy and for promoting uh, a national unity and national consensus. Um, Clement, the, the, uh, how to collect from as many people as possible was your question about widening the tax base. When we talk about um, widening a tax base, we don't just talk about as many people as possible, because widening the tax base, you, you widen the tax base certainly by bringing more taxpayers into the tax net, but you also widen the tax base by bringing more income or more base of which, on which the tax is levied into the tax net. So for example, having a value added tax is, is an automatic widening of the tax base, and even though you might only have a small number of registered VAT taxpayers, the fact that the population who are paying the tax uh, are caught by the VAT means you have widened the tax base. But we have to be more creative when we talk about bringing people into the tax net. 
Uh, one of the things we're looking at in Burundi now is a proxy tax. Uh, so, for example, um, small businesses like, you know, motor scooters, taxis, uh, and so on, uh, to actually recover tax from them is, it can cost more than the value of the tax. So one way of dealing with it is to, is to have a fairly effective uh, business license fee which serves as a proxy for a tax and which uh, these small businesses would pay. They pay the license fee and that serves to be their tax. And you get even, even better uh, results if you, if you give that tax to the local authorities because then the local authority is empowered by receiving revenue and the, the small taxpayers uh, the costs of the local authority collecting that tax from the small taxpayers is, is much less than it would be from the central administration. So there are many, many ways of, of broadening the base. Um, we, we, we did a, a, a taxpayer registration exercise uh, in the last few months and we, we recruited another 7,000 taxpayers. But I know that even doing that, and we're, we're, we're making more and more penetration, but there are there are many, many uh, tens of thousands of very small business, uh, very small taxis, shop, shop owners and so on. It's just not worth our while in the central tax administration to incur the cost of collecting taxes from them. But it is worth having them registered, having them pay a business license fee, having that fee go to the local authority and, and empowering them. And I think that's, that will be our, um, our, uh, our approach. I wasn't sure about the last question about uh, political parties um, uh, owning companies. Um, you know, it's in some states you find political parties owning companies and cherry picking the best investment, which of course is wrong. Um, and it's something, it's something that, you know, the head of state and, and, uh, and others uh, have got to guard against uh, because there should be free ownership of companies. Uh, uh, and uh, certain certain owners should not have the power to cherry pick the best investments or to strong arm their way into into businesses that are profitable. Uh, but regarding multinational corporations and tax evasion, uh, that is certainly the case in Africa, and I've come across practical examples of it. Uh, we've seen multinational corporation transfer pricing, uh, outrageously transfer pricing. Uh, so that profits are taken out of Africa, well, not just Africa, but other parts of the world as well. And in fact, let's be honest, the multinational corporations are transferring pricing out of the UK. At, at the end of every, uh, and other, other, other countries, <laughs> so um, that, that must make political leaders in the UK a little bit uncomfortable because transfer pricing was always something that we thought only happened to the developing world. Uh, but. Um, so I'm being, a, I'm being a little bit provocative here again. Um, but uh, transfer pricing, uh, it, is a, um, it is theft. No question about it, it's theft. Uh, because at the end of every transfer pricing arrangement, there's a low tax jurisdiction, whether it's a tax haven or whether it's a, a low tax. Even Ireland is guilty of having a low tax uh, jurisdiction, which, which embarrasses me greatly, but uh, <laughs> doesn't embarrass anyone back home. <laughs> um, so there's always a, a low tax uh, 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 regime at the end of every transfer pricing uh, situation. There's one thing, one thing we have to remember about transfer pricing. It isn't just stealing revenue from the state which it is, it, is, it is that, but it's not just that, because a lot of the multinational corporations that operate in Africa and elsewhere, they also have minority shareholders. Now, the minority shareholders don't share in the benefit of the transfer pricing, because usually what happens with the multinational corporation is that it's got a purchasing arm, usually embedded either in a tax haven or between a tax haven and where it operates. And the, the, uh, there are side contracts which are outside the jurisdiction. So, so basically what happens is um, the multinational corporation is able, by using side contracts, it's able to take value out of the, the subsidiary where it's operating. But if the multinational corporation only owns, say, 75 or even 50% of the, 51% of the subsidiary, then somebody else owns the rest of it. And that somebody else is not sharing in the profits that have been transfer priced out of the country. So it's theft not only against the country, but it's also theft against the minority shareholders. And quite often, the minority shareholders are themselves the government. So it's worth 
it's worth bearing that in mind because it doesn't come across everyone's purview. Thank you. John, did you want to comment on any of the issues raised just, in this round? Just to like to add about broadening the tax base. I think perhaps one of the most important things is to show what taxes can do. The problem my own country has now is that it seems so unnecessary to collect taxes because you have so much money being generated by oil. And given the way in which it's been spent, uh, you can think of some very choice adjectives for what is happening to the oil money. But the point is against that background, you cannot really make a case of why you need to tax anybody. And your country is likely to have the same problems now or later. So, but it does point to the importance of the services that are provided as a result of state revenue, including taxes. If that problem can be solved, it's easier to, do, to make the case for why any kind of taxation is necessary and why it's less painful. But the other side of the coin is, of course, that at least in West Africa that I'm most familiar with, there's a whole community of traders who masquerade as informal sector players. Most of these, and they are, I mean, there are a lot of them from Cameroon all the way to, to, to Cote d'Ivoire and Senegal, and they have a lot of money. Under the guise of being informal, they do not pay any taxes. So I would say forget the young man on the bridge selling cigarettes and televisions, forget him, forget her, worry about those people, and perhaps proxy taxes is probably the way to get them. Because you're not going to get them through VAT in that sense, at least not initially. But simply through your business license might be a way to do that. Thank you. So um, we probably have time for maybe one or two more questions. Is there any, any other questions in the audience today? OK. Yes. One more of our fellow. Um, hi, I'm Sonia, also one of the fellows. Uh, so I just want to jump in again on this issue of the informal trading, especially in the Great Lakes uh, region, where I think it's, I can't remember the exact figure, but it's almost five times more than the, the, the formal um, trade, uh, speci specifically looking at the regional aspect and what role does the regional organizations play and what role should they be playing in trying to harness um, revenue from, from, from this trading and are they capable of, of playing that role? <clears throat> yes, it's, 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 one of the, it's one of the areas that, can I? No, go ahead, yeah. please. Yeah. That we're we're uh, looking at, um, we have looked at, um, uh, you know, with, with the East African community, we want, obviously, to encourage as many people to trade across borders as possible. Uh, there, there are issues around um, uh, having a documentation to prove the, where the goods come from. Uh, one of the things we've done is we have, um, it's called a certificate of origin. One of the things we've done is we've made it easier for small businesses to trade across borders by giving them a certificate of origin at the border post itself. Uh, which allows them to take the goods and, and sell them across the borders. Uh, so um, I, we're, we're looking at, at, at all kinds of creative ways that we can encourage particularly small businesses to, to trade across borders uh, uh, as, as easily and as quickly as possible. Um, there, are, you know, if there are countries in the region where, and I, I'm, I'm not including Burundi in this because it's not the case, but other countries where you have multiple roadblocks along uh, as people try and approach a border, and they pay a bribe at every one of them. And so by the time they, they get to where the goods are being sold, they've already paid a huge tax, but, but it's, been pay, it's been paid to corrupt officials. Uh, and, and usually you see these corrupt officials at border posts because they usually have um, fairly substantial stomachs and, and gold chains and, and gold bracelets around. <laughs> and they, they make a, they, it's, it's, it, what they are actually is they're actually a business masquerading as a, as a, as a government department uh, and they're an illicit business. So it's incumbent upon us, in, within the East Africa region, we, 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 we've, we've managed to put a, bring a halt to that, I believe. Um, and we're doing our best to, to facilitate the trading across borders of small businesses. Um. 
So, John, did you did you have have a question? Maybe you'll be the last question of the day. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you both very very much, and I thought all the questions from everybody here, including the fellows, were just terrific. I wanted to just broaden out. And just introduce that, yourself, John. I'm, I'm John Hirsch with IPI. Uh, broaden this out to the question of corruption more broadly, because most of your remarks kind of assume good intentions on the part of the leaders, and then they're only looking for the instruments to enhance revenue collection and deal with avoidance and so on. But it seems to me, and not only in Africa, <coughs> there are a lot of leaders who do not have good intentions. They're making money themselves, right? And their parties and their cronies and all of this. So what, what, what suggestions do you have? In other words, all the premise of your remarks assume the people at the top want to do the right thing and they're just looking for, and you, these are relatively smaller countries, Burundi and Rwanda, doesn't diminish what you've achieved. But I wondered if you could kind of more broadly talk about dealing with corruption. You know, you talked about the offshore problem, uh, all the con side contracts, but how, how do you get a better handle on these things at a highest level? I read somewhere a figure that there's about $20 trillion uh, has gone tr in, 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 ta in tax havens. And, and about half of that value has come from the developing world. So there are, there are many, many, uh, I mean, you know, the, the money in tax havens has obviously been laundered there. It obviously has a very bad source. Uh, so if $20 trillion is, is the correct figure, and if half of that is coming from developing countries, and there are lots of very, very wealthy people uh, in those countries not paying their taxes uh, and, and, and taking the money out by surreptitious means. You, you, you have to have um, international, concerted international, agreed concerted international action at the level of the tax havens. You know, tax havens were tolerated by the West when it suited us in the West. Uh, after the financial crisis in 2008, uh, countries began to realize that tax havens were negative for them, for, you know, OECD countries, were, tax havens were negative for them as much as they for <laughs> Am I being provocative enough? <laughs> uh, <laughs> as they are for, for the developing world. <laughs> so you've got to have, you've got to, you've got to have le laws at that level to, to, to create the transparency to outlaw um, the, the hidden the hidden companies the hidden the hidden assets and so on. How you do it and how how the the G8 will do it remains to be seen. But I think that's where the level of activity needs to take place at that level. Do you have anything on that one? Oh, I couldn't agree more. I uh, that you do need that kind of an international system that helps to minimize. The, um, the transactions to minimize moving corrupt money. In a way, for many developing countries, even if the money was stolen from, say, oil, if it was used in the country, it could be taxed at the other end. So in a sense, there is a sense from a structural developmental point of view that there is a double whammy issue here not only, so forget the moral aspect of it, it's not helping the country because the money is out there. So if we made it difficult for the international system for me to, to take it out, it will by itself very difficult to keep stolen money because you cannot keep it too quiet. The reason it goes out is that you can keep it quiet. So even if you do not emphasize that, that will tend hopefully take care of itself in the short to medium term. So, Focusing on attention on closing all the international loopholes will make it easier, I think, to handle the domestic end. Well, thank you both, Kieran and John, and all of you for the, the conversation today. Thank you very much for this opportunity of partnering again with the Peacebuilding Support Office. So we'll give you a round of, of applause and send on your way. <laughs>